thought I, I had no one who would share my heavy load. Then my mind went soaring back to a place I'd never been. And I realized that I was standing at the foot of my key. There were three lonely crosses on a hillside that day. And as I looked at my Savior, I cried, Lord, take me away. There was blood flowing down and thorns pierced his head. Then he cried, Father, forgive. And then my Savior was dead. Well, I stood there in silence thinking, Lord, how can this be? That your beloved son, he gave his life just for me. Oh, then I heard a sweet voice whisper, child, lift up your head. For the one that you see hanging there, well, Jesus, he's not dead. and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets rang the
I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had hoped.
I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches and toll. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hand than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus today Oh, I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause I'd rather be faithful to His dear cause I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame I'd rather be true to His holy name than to be a king of a vast domain and be Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today when I was lost in my sin Wash my sins away at all how sweet is the sound I once was lost but now I'm found God's amazing grace still amazes me there have been times I've walked away from the Lord my sins were many my heart grew cold the fellowship was broken I felt so all alone oh but it didn't matter how far I'd gone God was still faithful when I came back home my sins were forgiven and grace to me was shown now I stand here before you tonight rejoicing everything's all i 
know I fail Him still, but I'm so glad His grace never will. And I thank the Lord for the glorious night when the blessed Holy Ghost led me to the light at the altar where I prayed. Jesus washed my sins away and I know how sweet is the sound I once was lost but now I'm found God's amazing grace still amazes me and I thank the Lord for the glorious night when the blessed Holy Ghost led me to the light at the altar where I prayed Jesus washed my sins away and oh how sweet is the sound I once was lost but now I'm found God's amazing grace still amazes me oh yes God's amazing grace still amazes me Amen. Open your Bible up, if you will, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 4. Nehemiah, chapter number 4. And I can truly say that God's amazing grace does still amaze me. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah, chapter number 4. Every so often, there will be something that God will put on my heart that takes time to, to cultivate, takes time to come to surface. Sometimes, I don't ever know what God's doing, but I often say this whenever I come to preach, that a lot of times I just have to pull back the curtains and you see how the Lord is teaching me and you be able to watch and maybe, just maybe somehow, the Lord has helped me. He also will help you. A few weeks back, I went to my office on a Tuesday morning. I sat down in my study. And as many Christians will do, they have a lot of questions looking for answers. Some people sometimes will come to church on a Sunday morning and that's where they're looking for it. We understand that Church is a good place to go because as long as they're lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, that is the answer for all problems. It makes no difference where you are, what you've been through, how far you've come, how hard the battle may be or whatever it may be, Jesus is always the answer. But sometimes you need a word. In songs that we sing sometimes, it talks about the power of the Word of God. I can say this, there's a lot of things that do pass away, but I believe the Word of God, it endures forever. Not only is it a word, it's a sure word. In chapter number 4 and verse number 10, we come to a place. I want to read just this one verse, if I could, and go backwards and understand the story. The Bible says this in verse 10, And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. There is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. I'm interested in two words that's found in this text. It's the word strength and it's the word decayed. And really, just if I can, for just a few moments this morning, think on those thoughts about strength being decayed. I wonder today as we sit in 2022 if that is where your life may be. Now, you might not necessarily be at the bottom of the barrel, but I would say this, maybe you're a little weaker than you used to be. Maybe there's a marriage today that's not as vibrant as it used to be. Maybe there is a ministry, a soul winner, a singer, a preacher, a teacher, a mom, or a dad that at one time you ran and you ran well, but now things are different. The question that comes to our mind is how does this happen? How, how do we... 
how do we overcome it? How, how do we get back to where we not used to be, but where we should be for the glory of God? Because trials should never weigh, never take out the power of God from our life. I believe sometimes the, the greatest Christians that I know have been through the darkest valleys that we could ever imagine. Because in those moments when you are the weakest, you realize that His grace truly, it truly is sufficient. Let me tell you about something with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was in a good place. If I could just help you understand who he was before he came to this place. He, he was the cupbearer. He had a good position. If he was going to have a job and a career, it would be the career if you were not the king. It would be the career that you would want. He never had a need for anything. He had a close relationship with the king. He had intimate moments with the king. He was trusted by the king. He had a great opportunity. But the thing about Nehemiah is when you come to chapter number 4, you're going to realize real quick, he was not living out his career. He wasn't looking for a career. He was following the call that God put on his life. And I want to say this, that's not for every preacher and every missionary and everybody that serves in the ministry. No, if you're saved and you're born again, there is a call that is on your life. And every one of us must answer that call that God has put on our life. But I have learned that when you answer the call of God, listen, you're not fighting things such as flesh and blood, as the Bible says, but you're fighting against powers and principalities. And friend, it's not an easy fight. It's not a childish fight. It's not a passive fight. It's going to be the hardest fight you have ever been in. I don't even care if your background's fighting. There's no fight like a spiritual fight. So he answers this call of his life and he begins to step up to the scene and God uses him in a great way to start rebuilding the wall. I wonder today if there being anybody that can understand what it's like to be able to have a normal life and then all of a sudden you get saved and we have this false mindset that everything's supposed to be hunky-dory and then in the blink of an eye somebody pops your balloon and you realize, friend, it's not as easy as you thought it would be. It's not. I wonder as I study the scriptures, as the Bible says in the book of Colossians, chapter number 4, verse 17, and they say in the archivist, notice the text that says this, take heed unto thy ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. In other words, God, God's the one that called you. Those of you that are shaking hands at the door, God told you to do that. Those of you that serve in security and teach in a Sunday school class, that, 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 that study all week praying that a mom and dad would bring their children to Sunday school, listen, it was God that chose you. And by the way, that's the greatest work that you could ever be in is the work of God. But he says after that, he says these words, thou fulfill it. He almost had to command Archippus to finish what God had called him to do. And I'm telling you today, friend, I'm, I'm well aware of a lot of us, not one or two of you, but a lot of us, that you've been serving the Lord. And, and some people ain't stepping like they used to step. Some people ain't singing like they used to sing. Some people ain't confident like they used to be confident. Their, their strength has been decayed over time. And I wonder today if God's saying the same thing to us. The very thing that I called you to do fulfill it I, I don't know it but I, I would dare say why, why in the world was Archippus reminded of that was he too thinking about quitting was he at a place where he was staggering in his life was, was he discouraged was, was he downtrodden was he, was, was he empty of everything that was going on what, what was it what was the reason because somewhere somehow the Holy Ghost said you need to tell Archippus you need to finish what God's told you to do right. I don't know why but I know God chose him to do it but he also chose you and I to do something the same way he chose Nehemiah See, when you read chapter number one, and forgive me because I can't read, you don't have the time for me to read every chapter that's in the book of Nehemiah, so you can go back and study it yourself. But Nehemiah answered the call that God had put on his life like you and I did once we and I got saved. When we got saved and born again, God chose us to be able to do something for his honor and his glory. And thank God that he did. But the Bible says that when he heard about the wall, Nehemiah, listen, friend, he was moved. He was broken. He, he sat down, as the Bible says, and, and he wept. And he came to that place where literally that he had mourned. And, and he knew that somebody, somebody's going to have to stand in the gap. Everybody's against everybody. Nobody knows what to do. But somebody's got to stand in the gap. 
He sits in this place and he comes and he hears the work. He hears how it is struggling. And that might be you in your marriage. You know something's struggling. It might be you in the ministry. You know something's struggling. You know the next generation is struggling. Somebody is struggling. But somebody's got to step up for the glory of God. So that's what Nehemiah did. And the Bible says that after he mourned that he came up. And not only did he talk to God and God spoke to his heart. But he also he went to the king. And in his mind, this is what he knew. He knew this, that no matter what I do, I cannot sit back and be passive about this. And let me say this, if there's anything that matters to you, whether it's your children, whether it's your husband, whether it's your wife, it's your marriage, it's the ministry, it's the work of God, it's the cause of Christ, you understand if you cherish it, somebody's going to have to pay the price and get in the gap. So he knew this, if anything is essential, if anything matters, it's not my name. It's not the fact that I'm a cup bearer. It's not the title that I own. It's not that everybody knows me, and it's not that I have an easy life. That's not what matters. Amen. He said what matters is the work of God. And somehow, some way, we got to get together on the right side, and we got to see what God can do. But it's not going to get rebuilt just sitting there by itself. So he comes. In chapter number 2 and verse number 18, the Bible says that he speaks to the men. Then I told them that the hand of my God, which is good upon me, and also, as also the king's words that he had spoken to me, and they said, notice this right here, let us, notice this, let us rise up and build. So here Nehemiah steps up and he says, I'm going to answer the call. Man, now everything that, that, that had stopped and everything that had dwindled, these men have been trying to do this for years. And the Lord sends a, a fresh spirit the Lord sends this man with a new passion. And he comes in here and he begins to now speak what God has put on his heart. He talked about the favor of the king. And now all of these men that now were weary and well-doing, they were trying. They had stopped. They had slowed down. They said, Nehemiah, if you said God is going to do it, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to get behind you. I'm going to follow God. And let's rise up and build the wall. You know, I can think back in my own life where I've seen many of you, including myself, charge hell with a water pistol. I'm talking about, I remember when I first got saved and man, people would come in and, and I hate to use it this, this way, but there'd be fresh new converts come in and man, there'd be some momentum and then there'd be fresh converts and there'd be momentum and then the older converts sometimes would get weary and well-doing. That's just human nature. I'm not preaching at you. Friend, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost has been all in my tater patch on this and what happens is it's like we go in these seasons, we're up and we're down. It's hot and it's cold. It's summer and it's winter. We wonder what is it that's happened to somebody. And that's what happened, Nehemiah come along. And he shared what God had put on his heart. And he says, I don't know how. I don't know what's going to be done. I, I don't understand all of it. But he did tell the king, I need resources. This is my plan. He had prayed and talked to God. And because of that, he had favor. And these men got behind him. But here's the problem. You come back to chapter number four again. And what happened? Strength has decayed. In other words, if I can make it plain to you, listen, you start off, you run well. And in this journey, no matter what it may be, whether it be that life, marriage, ministry, where your Christian walk, whatever it is, you will run well and things will be exciting for so long. But in due season, sometimes there come some weary seasons. There come some battles that are hot. There, there come some burdens that are heavy. There come some lonely moments and some sleepless nights where you just don't understand it. And in the back of your mind, you know that you didn't sign up for that. That's not what you wanted. But anything God ordains, the devil always opposes. And we find ourselves going from chapter number two to chapter number four. And again, our strength has decayed. Questions that I asked myself on that Tuesday morning was this, is how does this happen? <laughs> I, I mean, listen, I'm not a Bible scholar. I definitely hadn't studied like uh, Brother Larry Walker or many other men, but I've, I've read the book of Revelation. I understand the end times. I know that Jesus is coming back. I understand that there's going to be evil men in the last days. I understand it. So how can you understand and believe something, but still in the midst of it all? In the midst of it all, your strength gets so decayed. What's the effects of it? I 
wrote it down there on my desk. How does it happen? How does it happen? What's the effects of it? Then my third question was this, how do I get it back? (laughs) Amen. And not just me, but many of you. I'm not trying to get in your personal business, but listen, it might be sin. It might be a problem. It might be your future. It might be a decision that you have to make. Listen, anything that you struggle about and weighs on you as a burden, it can decay your strength. That don't make you unspiritual. Are you understand what I'm trying to, that's just a human life. The Bible teaches from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation that we can do nothing without Christ. So you cannot do anything without Christ. And the moment that you try to fix life, fix your walk, fix your marriage, fix your ministry, the moment you start doing that is the moment that your strength will be depleted from you. So how does this happen? I want to give you three quick things if I can. And I'm not going to lie, it's not quick. (laughs) The first thing I give you this morning is this, the tactics of the foe. The tactics of the foe. In other words, what's the way that the devil fights? Tell us how it happens. Well, if you used to look there in chapter number 4 and verse number 1, I want you to notice what the scripture says. The Bible says, but it came to pass that when Sambalat heard that we, notice this, that, that we builded the wall, he was wroth. And took great indignation and mocked the Jews. In other words, he was mad. He was angry. That word wroth means he was was really angry. So I give you these things. What is a tactic of the foe? The first thing is anger. Anger. It's the first thing that comes off the word of God. It's the first thing to see in chapter number four and verse number one. That he was angry. And listen, that is the number one thing that we are fighting not only in this country, not only in this world, but even in the churches today. The number one issue, we live in an angry society. People hate people. People hate one side because they're Democrat. People hate the other side because they're Republican. People hate one side because they blame them for the gas prices and people hate the other side because of abortion and not abortion. I mean, there's so many different things and reasons for people to hate. It happens in school system. We sit around and we mourn in the state of North Carolina while in Texas, children are going back inside and trying to be able to have focus to be able to study their lessons and listen to their teachers. But the reason why it's so difficult for that young generation is because the devil... He understands the tactics. And he allows anger to get inside. And when he gets inside, he allows an 18, 19 year old boy, not even old enough to understand how to pay his own bills, not even old enough to understand how to be able to have a family. And somehow anger possesses him that he can take a man's life. Anger. I've never seen preachers so angry. I'm not browbeating. I look up to any man of God. I'd never say their name. But there's some preachers get up. You've heard somebody preach angry. It's not when they're loud. It's not when they're vibrant. It's not when they're quiet. It's not when they're, they're very meek. No, 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 no. I'm talking about when they, when they hate you and they tell you how stupid and dumb. I mean, you've heard preachers. Listen, God have mercy on us. Anger should not be in the pulpit, by the way. And anger should not be in the pews. Because what happens is it settles in and it changes us. And the devil knows the greatest tactic is anger. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter number one, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Listen, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. That's why the devil uses it. He knows there's nothing good that ever comes from anger. There's nothing. If the Bible says that the righteousness of God will never be brought forth, then he knows. That's what I need to use right there. In the midst of anger, it does two things. It provokes some, and to others, it just wears them down. I can remember when I was a kid, I... I lived on the west side of Charlotte. The only white kid in the whole community in the school, there was two of us and that was it. 
I can remember going down to the park for that matter. It wasn't even the park. I mean, I could walk down the street, whatever it was. I was still the only white kid. I mean, I'm telling you. And I would go down and, and I'd stay and play basketball. And, and at those times, listen, it was not shooting. It was not cutting one another. It, it was not such thing. And I'm not, promo- I'm not promoting this by any means. Please understand my heart. But kids used to fight with fists back in those days. Isn't that sad that we have to say those are the good old days? But I can remember literally getting so frustrated. We'd play basketball. We'd get out there and we'd get so angry. Somebody would get mad because one score was three to one, the other was three to two, or no, I got four to three, and then anger sets in. So then that anger rises up, and what happens now all of a sudden, everybody's coming in. It's provoking them. They're fighting. And you know what happened before you knew it? Every kid on the playground left because those that were angry provoked one another. And those that were around it, they said, I don't want nothing to do with it. I have seen the playground become the church in 2022. Nobody wants to be around that mess. Nobody. There's no such thing as justified anger. Now, I, I, you can, you can, the Bible says you can be angry and sin not, but the moment that you are driven by your anger, there is no justification because the Bible says, be you filled with the Spirit of God. So because you are a Christian, you can be angry because of, of sin or issues, or, but there still not, must not be an action or a motive because of anger. The Holy Spirit must still lead us. The devil knows it. Not only is that a tactic of the foe, but also ridicule. Notice what the Bible says right after that, that he took great indignation and he mocked the Jews. That means to question, to criticize. All right. I don't know how many of you be honest, but I'm going to be quite frank. I might not show it and my face might not reveal it if I'm good at hiding it. But I have my limitations, but I will confess. I don't like for you to talk behind my back. Amen. Not saying you are. I don't like for you to question me. Not is is that what you were preaching? I'm talking about questioning somebody's motives. And the reason is because of pride that's in my life. Now I'm just confessing. Now maybe you can get on board with me. Right? Because that's why this is a tactic of the devil. Because he knows if he can get to pride, then he can get to people. So what happens is there's this mocking that comes in. And the Bible says in verse number 2 and 3, notice, it was almost like they were, they were not just mocking them, but they were almost kind of, I, I don't know, maybe humiliating them or taunting them. The Bible says in verse number 3, talking about that, that building, or that wall, even that which they build, if a fox should go up, he shall even break it down, uh, break down their, their stone wall. So now it's like they're sitting around and, and they're taunting him and, and, and they're just trying to be able to do the, the, the work of God. Meanwhile, there's an enemy that's sitting back, lingering, taunting. Taunting. I went back and I was looking at some of my journals that I used to keep a couple years ago. And I remember writing down in my journal this thing, if the devil ever learns that he can distract you with personal attacks, he will never stop attacking you. Did you hear what I just said? If he ever learns that he can distract you by personal attacks and something that's in your life and keep getting close to you, listen, he's not going to stop. And it's not because he hates you and it's not because he hates me and it's not because he hates your marriage and your home. No, he hates God. So he's not going to stop. Not only is that that a tactic of the foe, but you see anger, you see ridicule. But notice in verse number 8, and conspired all of them together, notice this, to come up and fight against Jer- Jerusalem. Violence. That is a new tactic that's now coming. Everybody has this, this thought process of violence. Of violence. Tell me why. Because it causes division. It causes discord. It causes disruption. 
Matter of fact, let me just tell you how smart the devil is. Notice if you read after that, verse number 8, he says, if I, against Jerusalem, notice this, and to what? Hinder it. That's what the devil's doing. He's thinking, you know what? I, I, I ain't even got to show up on the scene. I'm just going to use me some puppets. Can I just say this? I don't like nobody using me as a puppet, even if it's the devil. Y'all help me preach right there. I mean, it's, it's one thing to, to, to be a puppet, but for the devil to use me as a puppet, and by the way, that's all he's doing. That, that's all he does. Listen, you get mad at your husband, you be mad all you want to be mad. But all he's doing is using that as a doorway to get inside of your home. You hear me? That's what he's doing. I don't have time, but if you go through chapter 5 and chapter 6, you keep reading. Listen, he uses the, the tactic of division. He uses the tactic of, of discouragement. He uses the tactic of, of deception over and over and over. Whatever it is that he's got to use to distract you, to defeat you, to hinder you, he's going to do it. He don't fight fair. And I've said this often, behind every enemy that you see, there's an enemy that you don't see. Somebody help me preach right there. That's the battle. That's the enemy. That's the one that's attacking our children and our homes and our marriages and the ministry. That's the one. Listen, y'all can say what y'all want to. This public humiliation of everything that I believe, I, I could care less what any of you say, the news, the media, all the Facebook, the tweeting, all that other stuff. Yes, there's some good, but more people have used it to be able to justify their cause of anything than anything else. The devil uses it to sow discord and to be able to bring blame. There's nobody that should ever think they got to go public to be able to humiliate somebody that's not of the Lord amen and ain't nobody done that to me so don't worry about it right now don't go home and tweet nothing amen I don't have I don't have Twitter anyway so it'll be all right <laughs> it does it does I don't agree with it and let me tell you why you ready look up here Because I know me. I know me. I know me. Over the last few years, I've never seen so much as what I've seen since right at COVID and before COVID. I've seen so many tactics that the devils use. And listen, we can all agree on some of them. At first, it was the, the vote for the country president. Then it was mask. Who's going to wear a mask? Who's not going to wear a mask? Then it's going to be a vaccination. Who's going to have a vaccination? Who's not going to have a vaccination? And some of us already get kind of puckered up right there as soon as we get talking about it. That's how much the devil used it. Listen, I want to be healthy, but I want to be a Christian who's healthy. Right? I, 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 I'm not going to let my beliefs or, or what it is ever, ever supersede who I am as a Christian. And if I'm right or wrong, I still believe there's a right way to handle that and a, and a wrong way to handle that. And the reason we can do it the right way is because before I think about anything else and before I identify with anything else, and I don't care if it's rich or poor, or black or white, purple or green, military, not military, whatever it may be. No, you're a Christian first. That means you belong to God. So nothing else has the choice to make you respond. So it's only the Lord himself you must submit. But I've seen so much happen. I've seen good people walk away. I've seen bad people walk away. Not just from church, this church. I'm talking about churches. And, and, and I'm not talking about just relocating to different things. I mean, I'm just trying, there's been a lot of division. I, I went into the hospital this morning. And listen, I mean, I about fell out on the floor right there. I, I literally walked in. And, and all there is is somebody, hey, do you have a temperature? Do you have COVID? No. Used to, I mean, uh, man, you had to go through all the surveys and check all the things off. I'm like, man, here we are, 2022. Finally, after two years, you're going to tell me everybody quits asking? I mean, it's, 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 it's just changed everything and everybody. And you understand, it's, it's tough. It's hard. And the devil, again, I say to you, whatever the devil knows gets to you, if he knows it gets to you, he's going to keep it coming. I, I mean, I, I think about all of my life, I, I, and I know others have seen the same thing. You can relate to these times in your life when you face difficulties. 
tactics where you, you feel like you're, you're Joshua and, and then your Moses is gone and you don't know what to do. The, the devil knows how to sometimes discourage you and he will speak to you. And if you listen to his voice, listen to me, you will quit and you will throw in the towel. He knows what it's like to be a Elijah and be able to sit you to a place to where you, you literally feel like you're all alone and you separate yourself from people and you go to a place to where literally you just want to throw in the towel and ask God to kill you. He knows how to get you to that low spot. He knows how to make you like David. Many of you just like me, you've been in those, those valleys. And he knows that if David, if David could go up there and do that, listen, and he's the only one, that David's the only one that had that courage, but the rest of those jokers, listen, they were scared and they had no backbone. And all they, listen, all they did was fall because a giant was standing out there, but that wasn't David. That wasn't David. And you've got to make your mind up that there is no such thing as a giant that's ever greater than God. Whatever God chooses, God can still do. And it makes no difference the authority the devil has. God is still on the throne and he's still in control. Listen, I have stood at Red Seas and standing at a Red Sea. I, I have seen no hope on either side. But yet, I still hear the voice say, stand still. And I'm telling you, we must know there are tactics of the foe. Not only do you see the tactics of the foe, but I give you a second thing this morning. The tendencies of the faint. What are they, Brother Jason? Well, I want you to notice it was found in verse number 10. We read it a while ago. He said, and Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burdens, notice this, is decayed. That means when you get tired. What, what, what's the tendencies of the faint? What, 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 what's going to happen? How, how, how do we respond? How do we respond when we get so low and so empty and so hopeless? That word decay, it means to make weak. It means to stumble, to stagger. It means to fall under a load. That's what decay means. And by the way, let me say this. And decaying always starts from the inside out. And some of you understand what it's like. You get to a place where you just don't know what to do anymore. You get to that place where you kind of, you come to a standstill and you're wondering, God, how, how do I keep doing this? How, how can we make it work? I, I, I'm reminded, and I know some of you husbands are a lot smarter than me probably, but at my house, whenever Christmas is done, if I got to take, matter of fact, let me tell you what I do at my house. All y'all write this down because you'll thank me next year at Christmas. We don't, we don't even take the lights off the tree. I take plastic wrap and wrap it around the tree, and I set it up, and literally when it comes time for Christmas, I cut the plastic off, and boom, there it is, already ready. Yeah, amen. You'll thank me next year. Trust me. But you know what life is like? When I used to take those lights off the tree, I know they make things. I'm sure some of you men are so intelligent. You probably made one. But you know you roll it up like you roll a hose or a drop cord and it looks all fancy and nice. Next year you unroll it and bam, there it is. It's perfect. Not me. I just throw it all down and hope to God I ain't got to get it back out next year. But you know, Sometimes that's the way life is. At first, it all works well, and it seems to be so much beauty. And then after a while, it gets to be tangled, where it's almost like you can't even unfold it the way it needs to be. Why? Because sometimes life is just messy. Amen. Amen. So what are the tendencies of the faint? Number one, write this down. You ready? We magnify our problems. I want you to notice in verse number 10 what the Bible says. It's all scripture, friend. It says that the strength of the bearer of burdens is decayed. Notice the next line. And there is much rubbish. We magnify our problems. I mean, it's, the moment something happens... It's so big. I mean, going back to David, can you imagine all those? They, they seen that nine foot six Philistine and they think, oh, there's no way. Everything seems to be so big. But yet David says, wait a minute. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I don't care how big he is. But meanwhile, everybody else is in the shadows saying, 
Look how big he is. Look at his armor. He's a trained fighter. There's no way I can overcome this opposition. There's no way, surely, this is the valley of defeat. Surely, this is the last chapter. Not David. Not David. He says, I refuse because it makes no difference how big my problems are. My God is still able and he still has all authority. It's easier said than done. Matter of fact, we should all write that down on a bunch of cards and the next one of us that starts to complain about something, excuse me, we need to hand it to them and say, hey, you remember what we said? We magnify our problems. I don't know if you are bad about this, but I'm terrible about it. My wife can tell you, I wake up, I'll sweat in the middle of the night, wake up over and over and over. Man, I wake up thinking about stuff. And people just sleeping. Now, now listen, again, I'm confessing. Do you think that's of the Lord? It's different if he wakes me up and says, let's talk. But if I'm getting woke up because of my own stress, y'all help me now. I know I'm not the only one in here that's like this. And sometimes life and marriage and home and children and your burdens and, and your decisions and your promotions and your money, it brings these things in your life. And what we do is we have a tendency because of the tactic of the foe, we have a tendency sometimes to magnify those problems. You know what happens? We get so focused on the problems that we fail to see the progress. But you notice what the Bible says in verse number 6. I love the Bible. Somebody say amen. amen. He says, so built we the wall, and listen this, and the wall was joined together unto half thereof. They get to verse number 10, and it's like we can't build the wall. We can't do this. We, we have no strength. It's decayed. I'm done. It's over. There's no use. It's not even possible. But they forgot in verse number six that it's already halfway done. How many times do you and I fail to focus on all that God's done, but all we do is see right now what he's making us stand still because of? Y'all help me now. I'm telling you. People get married, man, they'll be married 15, 20 years, like I said, and all of a sudden they come to one mountain, and it's like that's the first mountain they've ever been to, but they forget about when they first got married. They forget about the first argument. They forget about when they didn't have money. They forget about when they didn't even make enough money to be able to pay their bills, but God somehow worked it out. They forget about when they had no joy, when they couldn't have children, and God gave them children. They forget about the prayers that went up for that. They forget about the times of loneliness when nobody else was around, but they had to hold tight to the hand of God, and God helped them through. They forget about that. They forget about the times when they would come to church and there would be a problem or another problem or a situation and all of a sudden they come to this problem. It's like it's a new problem or it's the first problem. That's not the case. They forget about the, the, the Red Sea that's been parted before. They, they, they forget about the giant that's already fell to the ground. They, they forget about all those moments. And sometimes we're just as guilty. And then they go 15, 20 years walking away from each other because of a, of a mountain that just showed up. But they forget all of those other mountains. All of those other prayers. God help me. Y'all help me preach. Not only do we magnify our problems, but secondly, we minimize the power. I want you to notice what the Bible says. It says right there, and notice this. He says, there is much rubbish. There they are magnifying the problems now all of a sudden so that we are not able to build the wall. Notice the words, we are not, we are not, what? Able. Well, the truth is we ain't able. But he is. And when we get to that mountain, we say it's impossible. When we get to that Red Sea, when we get to that giant we get to those walls of Jericho that's supposed to fall and they don't see when it seems like the sea rises up against us and, it, and it's tossing us back and forth and back and forth and it's beating the sides. Yeah, we can't do it. But God still can. And I just say this, that's the only reason why I'm still in it. A long time ago, I confessed in a minute, Lord, I can't. But I know you can. So then I reply to the Lord. Then I will, Lord. Imagine Abraham. 
He didn't know there was going to be a ram in a thicket. But because he trusted the Lord, he said, Lord, I will. I'll go. I'll go give thee my son, my only son, whom, who I love the most. Lord, I'll give him to you. If you tell me this is what's best for me, and you tell me this is the sacrifice that I got to make, and most of us say, Lord, why not them? Why not somebody else? Why, why can't this be somebody else's life? God says, because it's not you, you're just the vessel. Amen. And use that in your marriage. Use that in your family. Listen, God gave you those children. There's a reason why. Don't say I can't fix them. Now you can't, but God can. So you do right. You pray right. You live right. You act right. You follow the Lord. You listen to his voice. God will help you. Don't tell me there is no such thing. No, God is able. The key is not God's not able. The problem is we just ain't listening. You say, I can't get my life back on the right path. I don't know how to be able to fix it. Well, it's not because God ain't telling you. I'm in the same boat. I mean, listen, God speaks to us. There's things that happen. The question is, are we hearing his voice? And, and listen, further, furthermore, is his voice louder than everybody else's? Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Lord, I want to hear from you. Lord, I want to hear your voice. And sometimes, as I say often in Psalms 23, he leads us beside the still waters. He leads us to the green pastures. But remember, sometimes he leads us through the valley of the shadows of death. But he's still leading us. Are you with me? I know I say it often, but Lord, it seems like the death of me. It seems like this is it, Lord, I don't, but the, but the shepherd is leading. He's leading. I give you these verses, I'll move on. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6, he says in verse number 6, just listen to me. He said, Who hath also made us ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit? For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Listen, we can't do it by ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God, is what the Bible says in verse number 5. So in other words, you're right. We can't do it, but God can. He says in Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 6, being confident in this very thing. Let me just say, are you still confident? Come on now, y'all help me, friend. Are you still confident? You got saved, born again, God's good. Praise the Lord, I'm going to heaven. Are you, are you still confident? I, I know it's hard. I know things are different. Life is different. School is different. People are different. You are different. Ah, we are all different. But Nehemiah said, I'm not going to use that as an excuse. This ain't about me. He's the great I am. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He was before me. He's after me. He knows where I'm going. He knows where I've been. He's laid the foundation. He's going to be the finisher of everything. So therefore, I am still comfortable. He says, listen, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Meanwhile, I'm sitting back, feeble need. Feeble need. Did you hear what I said? It's the tactics of the foe. Who's the foe? The devil. Amen. It's the devil. He's the one that's the enemy this morning. It's him. Not only do we magnify our problems, I'm talking about the tendencies of the faint. Y'all with me say amen. Not only do we magnify our problems, not only do we minimize our, the power, but notice this, this is big. We cease from the labor. That is a tendency of the faint. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 11. And our adversary said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them, notice, and cause the work to cease. In case you forgot and didn't know, I want, I want you to hear me well what I'm about to say to you. Mom, dad, husband, wife, servant of God, whoever you may be, teenager. The devil wants you to quit. I'm just going to sum it up and why you're fighting. He wants you to quit. That's what he wants. He wants that mama to quit praying for her babies. He wants that daddy and a husband to quit praying for his family. He wants that young children's Sunday school class to quit 
having a teacher that prays every week, even though many children don't show up, he wants you to quit believing that God will send them. He wants to defeat you. All oh, this. If he can get God's greatest warriors off the front line. We know he hadn't won. But just think of the division, the discouragement, the discord. The Bible says in Proverbs 24.10, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Hey, listen to me. It's not easy. It's not easy. But do you realize you're on the winning team? I mean, that's it. Not only do you see the tactics of the foe, the tendencies of the faint. Now the question is, what do we do? How do we overcome it? I want you to notice this and I'm done. The triumph of the faithful. The triumph of the faithful. I'll give you a few verses, but first I share this with you. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, is required in a steward that a man be found faithful. Listen, somebody might be able to sing better than you. They might be able to teach or preach better than you. They might be able to do a lot of things better than you. But there's one thing that God requires of you that don't matter by how you compare yourself to others, that you can always be faithful in doing it, and that's simply being faithful to God. Just be faithful. Do your part. Do what God asks of you, not man. Do what God asks of you, not what you think you need to do. You be faithful. Faithful to what, Brother Jason? Number one, pray. Brother Jerry Wayne, will you come to the piano, please, sir? Pray. Look at me. Pray. That's the first thing. Pray, pray, pray. If you can't pray, just get down and close your eyes and be still and be silent. It won't take long. The Holy Ghost will meet with you. I'm telling you. The Bible says in verse number four, notice, hear, O our God. They start, they start crying out to God. Go to verse number nine. Look at this. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God. Faithful to pray. In chapter number one, listen. Literally, you read chapter number one. The entire thing was conceived in prayer. He said he found labor at the end of chapter number one. It continued in prayer. And then you come now to this chapter. And you're going to realize soon it's going to be completed in prayer. It's conceived in prayer. It's continued in prayer. And it's completed in prayer. How did I get there? I just prayed. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. My eyes were closed. I just prayed. <laughs> you just got to keep praying. Verse number six, the Bible says, notice this. So built we the wall. Second thing I give you about being faithful is not just faithful to pray, but faithful, listen, to do the job. You just got to do the job. You need to make up your mind right now. I'm determined to do what God wants me to do. I'm determined. Just make your mind up no matter what happens. I'm just going to stay the course and listen to God. No matter how long it takes, I'm going to stay in my marriage. I'm going to stay in my home. I'm going to keep praying for my children. I'm going to stay in the ministry. I'm going to keep serving. You will never accomplish anything if you don't stay at it. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> you got to stay. Stay. You say, my home is struggling. Dad, stay. <laughs> Say, it might be a mess, and I might be the mess in it, but I have made a decision a long time ago. I'm staying here until God chooses to take me home. Them kids might walk away, and 
they might choose their own path. Just stay on your knees. Keep praying. They're my babies. They're my babies. <laughs> when I look out here, this is my stay. This is my stay. I'm not a perfect man. But you need a shepherd. You need somebody to watch after your souls. To pray for you. That's my stay. The third thing I give you this, be faithful to what? Encourage one another. It's Bible, friend. Let me help you. Notice in verse number 14. I hope you go home and read all this. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people. Notice this. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord. They encouraged one another. They were faithful to encourage one another in the middle of the battle. Can I ask you something? When's the last time you encouraged somebody? When was the last time you just let them know you loved them? The Bible says this in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, verse 24. Let us consider one another. Maybe that's where it starts. Hey, when you come to church, do you see anybody other than your problems? Do you see anybody other than, than your pew? Consider one another. My greatest pick-me-ups have been sitting in maybe not these four walls, but in the church that these four walls have set in in my last 18 years, it might be somebody. I, listen, man, I got a card this week. It was for my anniversary. My anniversary was on, on I guess, last week. But anyway, it's May 7th. It wasn't even this week. But what it said to me and my wife, <laughs> that was the Lord knew that. The Lord knew when we needed it at our house. Y'all with me? I mean, that's God. But somewhere, somebody has to consider those text messages you send for one another, phone calls. Used to, we used to knock at the door, right? We got away from those days because everybody now, you'll never want nobody to come to your house or <laughs> put the kids up. <laughs> Tell them get down out of the tree, quit throwing rocks. <laughs> Amen. Consider one another. Let me finish reading that. Not forsaking. Listen to this. I'm like, whoa, whoa, let's go back and read. And let us consider one another. Watch this. To provoke unto love and the good works. Oh, my soul, we could preach all this. Encourage them to love. To love. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together in the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. Let me give you a fourth thing. Faithful to pray. Faithful to do the job. Faithful to encourage one another. Watch this now. Faithful to wait for clarity. Verse number 15. You read it. The devil wants you to jump quick. You better be patient to let the Lord lead you. You wait for clarity. The fifth thing I give you this. Prepare for battle. You need to be faithful to prepare for battle. The Bible says in verse number 17, And they which build it on the wall, and they which bear burdens, notice this, which those that laid it, every one of those with his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. So they were working with one hand, and they had a weapon with the other hand. You want to know why? Because they were prepared for the battle. You know how you do that? Ephesians 6. Every day you wake up, put on the whole arm of God. I hope you're listening to me. Are you listening to me, church? Are you listening to me? You're in a battle. Mom, dad, you better look at those kids. Mom, or husband, wife, you better look at one another. You're in a battle. You're in a battle. Church, you, you better look across. You're in a battle. The devil don't like this. The devil don't like this. And every day you get up, listen, more than you better think you got gas in the tank so you can get somewhere because it's $5 a gallon. You better put on the whole armor of God because the devil's going to attack you.
Are you listening to me? That's essential. I can ride a bicycle or run. It might take me a little time, but I'm going to get there. Amen? And if it's too far, I'll get on Michael's back and tell him to jog. Somebody say amen. You better put it on. Because sometimes your family's going to get up and not put it on. And you've got to fight the battle for them. You got to fight it for them. The last thing, and I'm done. Be faithful to what? To endure. The Bible says this. So we labored, verse 21, we labored in the work. Verse number 23. So neither I nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that every one of them put on for the washing. You just got to learn to stay and endure it to the end. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 5, I quote it often, that he may establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. But it does not come until after verse 9. There's a word that's in there called afflictions. Those afflictions are what God used there, if I can say it this way. Those afflictions are God's instruments to mold you. But he says, after you've suffered a while, that word while is a term that's used for, for time. That means it has a time that it ceases. After you serve, after you, you, you suffered a while. That means it's going to come to pass. Are you with me? Nehemiah said, listen, I, all I know, boys, watch me now. I'm done. I don't have an option. I've already decided a long time ago with God and the king that I'm going to build this wall. And the devil can taunt me. He can stab me. He can mock me. And what he says might be right about me. But until God tells me to get off this wall... I'm staying on the wall. So this morning, it might be your marriage, your home, your children. It may be something that seems to be insignificant to everybody else, but to you, it just weighs you down. I ask you to remember this, that even though your strength is decayed, that God is still able. Look at me. Stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. Our Father, it is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart, and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God, and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you in this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved, and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way, and there's something heavy on your heart, Again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.